School Board of Education to order. First order of business this evening is our Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Ms. Cheyenne Farrakoff. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next order of business we have additions and or corrections to the board agenda. Not to be smart, Mr. Laws, but you did change the person who was doing the flag, so yes. That would be the only change. We have. Okay. <laughs> only change I have as of right now. None others. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The agenda is approved. Next order of business we have is the. Uh, Approval of the consent agenda. Questions? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. We hear a second. Second. Moved by Mr. Cross and second by Mr. PQ. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Agenda is approved. Next order of business we have is personnel matters, employee termination. Mr. Schiller, is there a motion that you would like to bring up? Yeah, I'd make, like to make a motion, Mr. President, that we act upon the termination of employee number 21-102. Do I hear a second? Second. Been moved by Mr. Schiller, second by Mr. Handy. To act upon the termination of employee number 21102 as discussed in executive session. Correct, Mr. Schiller? Correct. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, nay. <coughs> Motion is carried. Administrative contracts. Um, at this time, the administration would like to present the board uh, with administrative contracts for their. A review and approval. Um, hear a motion. So moved. Hear a second. Second. Been moved by Mr. Handy, second by Mr. Crossan to approve the administrative contracts as presented <clears throat> by the administration from the executive session. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> Motion is carried. Updates and action items. Superintendent's report, Dr. Menzer. Um, I have three uh, relatively brief items under my part of the updates and action items for my report. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Light, a deputy superintendent, if he could uh, provide an update on the Colonial School District strategic planning effort. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I guess it was probably around six, a year ago, I guess, at this point that we came to you and said, outlined our process for the strategic plan for the coming year. Um, and of course, uh, that was uh, about an 18 month process that we had outlined for you. I wanted to give you an update as to where we are at this point. Um, and so we're wrapping up our engagement phase. We, uh, during that engagement phase, we trained 25 facilitators at nine uh, staff engagement sessions with over 150 participants, had eight family and community engagement sessions with over 75 participants. And we're pretty excited about the number of folks we've engaged with so far. Um, we're at the next phase that we, and we still have a couple of student engagement sessions that we uh, have to wrap up, which is really fantastic. Um, couple of William Penn and a couple of uh, the other schools. Um, after, so in the, as we're kind of transitioning out of the engagement phase, we're getting into the design phase. We have a, a design phase team that met last week. We um, uh, kind of gave an overview to that design phase team. This is, this is what we have been working on in the engagement phase. This is why strategic planning is important to the district. And then what, uh, and then we started to look at some, some uh, possible plans 
from uh, exams just from other districts across the nation. Um, so we can think about how we can construct a plan that's really meaningful and powerful for, for Colonial. Um, that work should happen uh, up and through probably mid to late July. And uh, I would hope that, uh, and at the same time, we'll also be looking at um, our achievement data and some other data that we have, as well as the um, data that was obtained during our, our, our sessions with families. And uh, we'll hope to bring something to the board, a draft, in August or September. And then the real work begins, um, where we begin to implement and then we engage with families and stakeholders uh, around the plan. Take the show on the road a little bit. The last strategic plan update that we did was what year? Pardon? What year was the last update? 2012. 2012, so mm -hmm. it's been nine years. Yeah, yeah, and 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 a lot of great things came out of that plan. Um, things like the William Penn redesign as an example, uh, our work um, that, that then uh, resulted in the middle school redesign work and also the power of we ultimately came out of that as well as um, our work in uh, the pre-K. So a lot of great things came of that. And you know, 10 years ago, they were just ideas and now they've really come to fruition and I'm, I'm excited for you know what, what's gonna be 10 years from now and what, what my colonial might look like. Does your group or think that the 10 year frequency is the right amount? Should it be less, should it be more? Typically a five year plan, and I and that's really where I would I would actually well two things. I think a five year like a real deep cycle review would be important, but I think even along the way, we need to do a better job of regular updates and regular engagement opportunities with the with um with the community to you know make sure that we're on course towards the, the goals that we have set forth in the plan. And um, and then to make any adjustments to the plan, so it's not a it's a living document, not not a static document, and, and we want to keep that alive and running. Is your plan designed to be five years that you're coming up with? So the one that we're in the yeah process. the one you're in process. So the one we're in process of doing, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that as a design team. Um, not only just like you know, it's really setting like five year goals and then evaluating your your progress towards those goals. Um, but the design team can also talk about like the frequency to which we're going to evaluate our progress towards those goals and then how we're going to communicate those goals and how frequently, you know, whether that be on a quarterly basis or uh, twice a year or once a year in an annual report type focus, which we haven't had an annual report in a couple of years. And sometimes there, I think, I think that would be a nice way to kind of merge two documents to make them really meaningful for community. Does the Department of Education have any oversight or part in your own plans? So they require us to, um, to submit a, a plan of goals um, each year and, and Dr. Mandrelson has, has to submit a plan as well um, and he gets feedback about his performance in, in that plan. Um, but as far as having a strategic plan, no. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think the other part that is really it's a, it's a great opportunity for us as a district to be saying, hey, you have to do this. Because when it's ha when you have to do this, then it becomes a checkbox and doesn't have the meaning behind it. And we're doing this because we know the district can help us um, really you know, hold true and, and, and be uh, focused and disciplined and accountable um, to the things that are important to the community. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. What role will the community play just not as a listening or recommendation as to really help them make those decisions so they can feel as though that they're a part of uh, what's going on in the district? Yeah, so, so I mean, during the engagement sessions, we had a really great dialogue with families and um, family members that participated and community members that participated. They provided us with a, a, a lot of insight into the things that would help us um, to be solutions in some of the areas that we you know, have identified as really critical. Well, now we're in this design phase. We have uh, about a half dozen parents that are on that um, design team. And I think they're also going to begin to uh, launch into, you know, help, help us really design something that is meaningful and, and representing the, the community as well. Um, and again, I, I don't want to be done. You know, like once the plan is kind of drafted out and approved, 
I think that's when that's when the work begins, right? And we continue to engage with families um, around, you know, what does this plan mean? How does it help our community? And uh, how can we how can we make it um, come to life? And how can we how diverse is that uh, community? It's it's pretty diverse. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't have the numbers off the, offhand, but I would say. Um, People of color are at least 50%, if not higher, from staff and from community. That's what it's, that's the question you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, next up uh, at the last board meeting, uh, uh, Mr. Law, as you asked uh, Emily to kind of have a update on where the district is with our SR3 funds. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Emily now to kind of walk through uh, where we are in that process. Uh, good evening, board members, Colonial Nation. Um, the, as part of your board documents, there was a, an overview document provided to you. It was a five page um, overview that contained, you know, Details on how the state allocation breaks down, as well as <clears throat> what the local districts are um, allowed to use the SR3 funds for. Um, there was also some, um, you know, some other kind of high-level details provided. Um, <clears throat> essentially, we can use the SR funds for, um, you know, for broad-based pandemic response, um, cleaning. Um, PPE provisions, addressing learning loss. There's actually a requirement that we use 20% um, of our of our allocation for to address learning loss. Um, and the allocation that we are um, that we're going to receive is 30.6 million dollars from the SR3 grant. Um, we have not submitted an application for this, but we, you know, <clears throat> we're having lots of conversations. What we're trying to do is take a strategic long-term approach to how we're going to, to spend out this money. Some of the key things that we've already identified as investments for this pot is the supervisor of, um, of extended learning opportunities, which, you know, is, is going to spear, spear up that, spearhead the learning loss efforts um, that we're putting together to ensure that there's a coordination there and that you know someone is leading that work in a thoughtful comprehensive way we're also um, this summer going to put out a grant manager that's going to help my office essentially uh, deal with you know the additional pots of money and the requirements making sure that we are keeping all of the pots of money um, <clears throat> squared away and and being handled appropriately um, one of the other investments that we've identified already is that, you know, with COVID quarantining and other things, um, the amount of documentation and um, volume coming through the HR office for leaves of absence and, and quarantining and so forth is requiring that we step up our capacity in that area. So we have a lead specialist that we're bringing on board. Um, <clears throat> that'll make two that we have now. We have one currently doing all of the district and she is well overwhelmed, um, doing a great job, but you know needs assistance. So we've got that posting out there. What we're trying to do is address things in a very systemic, comprehensive way so that the funds going out the door are, are going out in a thoughtful, um, a thoughtful manner um, so that we, are, we can build on the investment that we have and really leverage these funds um, to make a great opportunity for our, our students and our community. Um, Beyond that, we are still in the planning stages. There's still, you know, we're still waiting for some guidance from the Department of Education in terms of what the application process will look like and when the funding will actually be made available to us. Um, you know, as, as the conversations continue, we will certainly bring you more details, um, but we just wanted to basically kind of share the philosophy of how we're approaching putting the plans together. Um, this is, you know, to my knowledge, the largest um, single grant investment in Colonial in, you know, it's certainly in my tenure and as far as I know, going back a long time. So we, we're trying to make sure that it's thoughtful and um, and that we're not, you know, investing in things that, you know, when we look back five, 10 years from now, 
um, will say, well, that was, you know, that, that didn't move the needle for kids. It wasn't a good investment. We want to, we want to avoid those type of things. Okay. Now, I guess my question is, is on your five items you have there, six items, you have learning loss, and then you have the summer enrichment. Of course, the learning loss is a, is a large chunk for the university school day. That's the, uh, that's, yeah. that's the state, that's the state allocation. Go down to uh, the bottom, the middle of the page. You already passed it, right? Keep going up. Oh, that right there. Right. Okay. That's a, that's our break. That's our percentage breakdown right there. So okay, so we're good. That's the whole. That's all the LEAs in the state. That's all we have right okay. now. But of that three hundred sixty-nine million, Colonial is getting thirty million. Twenty percent of that has to go to learning loss, and then the rest is what Emily described. We can use it to address any of the things listed below in this document. That, support our operation during the pandemic to provide uh, learning opportunities for students. Okay, so my point is, you have to do well know, you and I participated, we participated in a discussion with a, another organization in regards to learning loss and whatnot. And we talked about summer programs. So that, that, that. Yep. You may want to talk a little bit more about that, but will we be able to take both of those line items and put toward those types of things? Well, we already have its learning loss and summary enrichment. That's correct. Yeah. So, so we have that flexibility there. Yes. Yes. We have, I mean, I don't want to say extreme flexibility, but there's a lot of flexibility here with a pretty good, a pretty sizable chunk of funds, as Emily has just said. And we are trying to be sure we're thoughtfully spending it so we get long term impact out of it over time, that we don't, we don't squander it away or double down or overspend or whatever you want to say like this summer we're not going to invest a bunch of this money in the summer because we already have money in summer from the previous grant opportunities so it's beginning to look at this learning loss through the fall into next summer and beyond to i believe there's some expended year dates in here i think it's like september 2024 yeah. as, a, as a as a date to throw out there well and along those lines appropriate today between the two of you if you could kind of give an update to the board of where we're what your plans are for what for uh, this summer type programs and learning that's oh. what we talked about once before so pete, pete could speak to that right, right. but let's let emily finish but oh, okay yeah. the appropriate time to do that yeah, yeah we don't wait uh, we get to my part about updating at the close of the year i'll have pete fill you in on the okay. summer um, I, I don't i don't have too much other information you know the planning is going to continue um I believe VOE has given us a little bit of um, information on deadlines. We have to have an application into them um, at some point in August. Um, I do think that our process will allow us to have something, you know, planned out before that. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's, it's walking that line between urgency and thoughtfulness and making sure that we're, you know, we're not just throwing money out there um, just to say that we were able to get it out the door. We want to do it in a way that is, um, you know, really is going to move the needle. The 20% the 20, 20 for learning loss, you know, it, that's about $6.1 million for learning loss um, over three years. So, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's a big investment. Um, you know, we normally have a budget of about $270,000 for extra time activities in a given year. So, Having over two million in one year is, you know, definitely going to be able to ramp up our efforts um, in whatever way we choose to put the programming out there. Um, but you know, but sustainability and um, and thoughtfulness is really kind of what we're looking at. You know, what we don't want to do is put a ton of programs out there that are meant to be sustained over time and that we have to, you know, then claw back when the money runs out. We want to we want to try to build programs in a way that we're building up the um, the supports in a way that kind of naturally, you know, they naturally um, lead to a more sustainable place in, in the long run. So one of the things that Emily alluded to um, is we're getting information from the DOE on a pretty regular basis. So it's kind of fluid because they're still shoring up how it's going to flow to the district. Um, I will tell you that transparency is going to be a big part of 
how this money is spent, uh, both from the feds and the state, as well as from Colonial, where it's got to be published on the website. Any data that we're using to make the decisions around where we want to put our, our, our resources has to have a data uh, data shown on the website to support that decision. And um, in this document, I think you'll see within 30 days, the feds expect of us receiving the money, the LEAs receiving the money, as Emily said, we have to have our plan or a return to school plan up posted on our website. And that's somewhere going to land like in mid August to the public for everyone to see. So transparency is definitely going to be a big part of this process. Community input and comment is also part of the return to school plan. Um, so again, to Emily's point, right now we're, we're, we're identifying some critical areas we know we're going to need to continue to operate and lay the foundation to make some of these decisions. And as we roll forward into the summer, I anticipate by the 23rd, we'll be ready to put our plan forward and submit uh, as we need to with, uh, with whatever process comes from the state of Delaware in e-grants, however it looks. Thank you very much for the question. Questions? Good stuff. Good. Robin, anything? No. Good. Ron? Okay. Uh, I'll just do a quick rip through for a close of the year and then preview a little bit of what's coming up next school year for the, for the board. Um, first off, if you did not get a chance yet last week, uh, the district released its first ever virtual art show uh, on Thursday evening. I strongly, I can't tell you how strongly I recommend you go to that link on the website. If you're not a digital, like three dimensional kind of walking on the TV person with a, with a mouse, don't do the walking tour yourself. <laughs> do the school by school room zoom thing that'll bounce you around your pieces. It is really, it is cool. I mean, I'll just leave it at that. Um, the uh, other thing last week, the seniors had their prom at the Hyatt Place on the riverfront. And by all accounts, it was a hit. Um, we did end up opening it up for the seniors to bring guests at the last minute so that we could bump up the capacity of the space. Um, you know, I, I don't know, it wasn't packed, it wasn't crowded. Um, one of your fellow board members, perhaps that's why he's not here, but he, uh, Mr. McGee, joined the festivities with his um, dapper suit and bow tie and had many a selfie with the principal and uh, <laughs> was dancing. yucking it up, dancing. dancing. Had a very good time, let's just put it that way. He was reliving his youth. Um, so it was a really great event. Um, uh, all, all smiles on the way in. If you see the gallery on Delaware Online, there's a gallery of our kids coming in and then smiles on the mask, under the masks when they were inside. Thursday night this week is our music showcase. It's gonna be, I don't know, we'll see. It's supposed to be pretty awesome. Cheyenne, I think you're, you've are you been a part of that. Is there anything that enticed the board about this music <laughs> showcase this week? Um, so it's gonna be outside, there's gonna be food, there's gonna be music. Um, there should be um, several different per, um, ensembles performing. So it really should be a fun time. Um, Bring your family and everything like that, and just have a nice time. It will be held at the high school. Yes. In the parking lot. Uh, drive-in style. Drive-in style. Yeah. yeah. But drive, drive in and drive around style. It'll be extreme to see. I mean, it's going to be exciting. Is that um, something that we're we're broadcasting to the public? It's. I believe Dr. Erskine. I think he's. It's being streamed as well. If I'm not mistaken. He said it was a little bit of a. Dr. Erskine indicated that it's going to be streamed, but it's been a little bit of an undertaking. I kind of more meant like uh, like advertise, like encouraging oh, public out, to come. Out there, Gabe's, Gabe's been pushing it out. Cool. Yeah. I'm assuming our PIO has reached out to the appropriate contact. Yep, they're pushing this out. What time does that start? Uh, yeah, let me check my calendar. It is a live event. I got to go to that. <laughs> I have Thursday at six. I have the thirteenth, the virtual, the twentieth. When's the live one? It's the 20th. It's the 20th. There's a virtual one on the 13th. The live one is on the 20th. The virtual one is going to be also pretty spectacular from what I understand as well. Okay. Um, then there's commencement. 
Well, actually, there are going to be recognition events, I know, at a high school specifically, and I'm not sure about uh, the middle schools or the elementary schools and if they're doing any events, but I do know William Penn traditionally has an underclassman awards night and senior awards night. When they start pushing out those events, I'll make sure the board gets them. Um, I haven't seen those dates uh, come across my desk, but those you're always invited to attend any of these events. Um, some of them are a combination of video, live stream, or uh, sundry events. Is Leach having an in-person uh, graduation? There, Leach is having an in-person graduation on the 28th, and there's only one grad, and they're limiting the number of people they can invite because of COVID. So they do want to do an in-person for this one grad. So and I think Ron is, is representing the board. If you're interested in attending as a guest, I would say email the principal to find out what the seat count is from the families of the grad and what's coming in. May 28th, 10 o'clock? Uh, I have one o'clock. So one to two, it'll be one grad. So it's it'll be probably pretty, pretty quick. Uh, the, the William Penn event has been pushed out to families and then oh. families have been Oh, it's okay. for the for the uh, in person for the for the music at the out the, yeah the in person event. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so nothing to the public. Yeah. Then. Oh, okay. Well, it's pushed out to the public. Yeah. Or is there any plans yeah, to push it out? The, the, the three games. Okay. Right. So <laughs> families were invited. Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't know what was being encouraged. Like, if you guys actually wanted to see public, or you think family would just I, fill I, the. I don't know. What's the sense on that? Are they trying to limit the. the so I, I'm sure they're probably thinking about the capacity and mm -hmm. all the things that come with that. So definitely so join the family, virtual so families one on first. first. So families and the board first. Yes, and, and staff. Families and staff. Yes. yes. Um, it, and I do believe it is going to be live stream type thought of this. But I read that. Perhaps. Perhaps. So. Yeah, I'll let you know. Uh, and then there's commencement. Um, which I, I've indicated to you all, we are gonna be at the University of Delaware. It will be Friday, June 4th. Ceremony will begin at 4.30. Um, we are still, we have a meeting on Friday with the University of Delaware, 8.30, to talk about the logistics of the facility, how they're gonna allow us to run the program. Uh, we don't really know at this point. So there's no, we don't know what the board's involvement is gonna be with respect to engagement with the process or as attendees. We'll get that to you as soon as we can. Um, we'll be, at a minimum, if you're planning on attending, please plan to be there by 3.30. An hour, gives us an hour to get squared away, whatever the logistics will be. You can bank on if there's a William Penn graduation in Newark, that 95 will have a four car pile up southbound and <laughs> room 273 will be backed up all the way to the farmer's market. Or the farmer's market. And it'll be fun. <laughs> so you can factor all that in and just plan on being there as soon as you can. Um, it's just, it's <laughs> delightful. Happy to see it's happening. Clockwork. Yeah, we are very excited Thank about you. the University of Delaware. Uh, our, first of all, our team staying engaged with UD, which was not an easy process. The high school and director of schools, Jim Comages. A lot of times just kind of like knocking on the door. Hey, we're still here. Hey, we're still here. Hey, we're still interested. Hey, we're still interested. And you know, finally they said, okay, we're gonna do something. We don't know what, we're gonna do something. And then we just kept coming back to the door, back to the door and um, kudos to that team for sticking at it and uh, getting the venue, getting the date as well as a rain date. So if there is a serious issue with the weather, we do have a, we have a rain date. I don't have that date, but I do know we do have a secured second date. Um, the, oh, I just got a text from somebody. Oh, Lisa Brewington must be watching or something. Uh, senior awards is five is May 19th and underclassmen is the 26th. She said, yes, she is watching. Right. Can you say that again, please? Yeah. Uh, Phil, will you just bring Lisa up onto the screen for us, please? It would just be way easier. She could tell us what's going on. Lisa, I hope you're dressed appropriately. Yes, Lisa, please come on. Uh, you, yeah. you don't have to turn your camera on, Lisa, but at least can you tell us what's going on? Because I don't even know what the events are going to look like, please. <laughs> I can't. All right, she can't. All right. Now they're bringing her up. They're going to bring her up. Because I don't know what it, if it's a virtual or if it's going to be live. Um, I'm about to put somebody on the spot. Yes. So Sorry, Brew. <laughs> 
Hi, it's going to be virtual. Sorry. <laughs> uh, what's the what's the timing on it? Are you guys going to release it, or is it going to be like a certain part of a, an event or anything? No, it'll be similar to what we did last year. So we will uh, put out the time um, for it to stream live on. Well, not live, but we recorded everything, and it'll stream um, on YouTube and on our website. Okay. So you you advertise it, correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. And any, you have, did you want to fill, fill in the crew about any comments about Leo at the prom? Did he behave? <laughs> Leo had a wonderful time. We were happy to have him. He um, and I were texting um, about something else and I was telling him that we were having the prom and he said he wanted to stop by. And so I thought he, I thought he was just going to stop by, but I offered him dinner, he stayed, he had a good time, we danced, took a couple of selfies. I think he was there for about maybe one or two hours. So he had a really good time. So <laughs> next year you guys can all come. <laughs> oh, thanks, bro. You're welcome. All right, sorry to call you on the spot. That's okay, <laughs> that's okay. All right. Take care. All right, um, that's it for the close out of the school year. Um, any questions about where we are in that space? And I'll just give a quick preview to uh, a preview of uh, coming school year. That's it. So next year, I mean, to keep it real simple, our plan is 100% in person, five days a week. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, we did do a, a, a interest email phone call, phone call where a parent had us, everybody got their own call, their own link to tell us if they wanted to opt in or they were interested in opting in to virtual. If they didn't opt in to be considered for virtual, they're, going, they're being considered face-to-face. -face. At this point, the first whack at that, it was about 950 interest in virtual. So that's about 9,100 in person-ish. The numbers don't all fit. It's close. You're good. Close enough. Uh, yeah. So we are we are still in the process of looking at the 950 because, uh, as I've said before, there are some families and students who may be requesting virtual that have not met with success or have not engaged to the degree that they their principals and school based teams <coughs> felt they should or their teachers felt they should. So this is it's only an option, and they're requesting it um, depending on. Uh, the schools and the directors of schools decision, there may be some families who will not be given that option. So the 950 is probably the max right now that we would see in that space. We are preparing to, uh, again, five full days a week, 100%. Uh, we're, we're anticipating a rollback in restrictions uh, over the coming weeks from the governor that will allow us to, to practice and prepare using our summer programs for things like transportation, seating spacing, cafeteria use, uh, protocol implementation that'll allow us to be ready in the fall. How many people did you anticipate doing virtual? I gotta say, it was kind of like a toss up of a little, I think, I thought it was gonna be a little less than 950. Pete, I don't know, were you thinking it was gonna be higher or where were you? Yeah, some people guess 10%. Uh, some people guess 10%. <laughs> I think there was a, I think there was a, there was some a some little wager people, on that one. So it sounds like somebody won 10% over there. Some people thought 30. I, think, <laughs> but, I mean, we'll see, you know. Um, well, what's the criteria to be able to go? Yeah, so that was, that's a good question. Um, we are looking at regular engagement and attendance and in each of the different levels, it kind of varies a little bit and then also academic progress. Um, so the principals will receive their list of students that have applied to be virtual and they'll review them against the criteria and then um, and then we'll communicate the families their acceptance or uh, the denial uh, at that at that point the, uh, there is the the piece right now currently on the books there are students with medical conditions who um, will, will have need to be strongly considered yeah um, well, and, that, and that's my point is it is it going to be you have to have a medical condition, or do you have to? That's one of the criteria. And what and what's the other criteria? Not not the performance based, because we're going to expect all of our students to be performing. I would I would hope. It's so. It's also 
there's a little bit of there's some students who are actually doing better than in the virtual than they were in person. Um, I mean, a, a real quick example is a child who for two years has been involved in truancy court for a variety of reasons and hasn't set foot in the school for two years has not missed a day since they've been virtual and is achieving at a level that's satisfactory to that principal. So that family, if they were to apply, that child would be considered based on their progress and performance. The goal is not to just have a virtual offering just because of the pandemic, but there's a goal here to develop a virtual program that meets the needs of community and the families and certain students who might struggle in a school setting. Um, I know from my tenure as principal at William Penn that there were at least 30 to 40 students on a daily basis who had school type phobias that could, couldn't, couldn't physically make it into classes or in the hallways for a variety of legitimate clinical, medical, psychological reasons, but they came to school every day. So they had to be, they were housed somewhere in the building with an office person or somewhere to be kept track of or made sure that they got their lunch and make sure they were doing their work. Those are students who might be thriving if they're going virtual for certain academic classes, but they might have to come in for a hands-on CTE class. So it's not just putting everybody in a virtual program and they're off to the side. So it really is a little bit of a hybrid type of a model that we're gonna to look to develop. But the criteria is family are interested, which is 950, but then they must be meeting with those certain academic engagement and attendance benchmarks or if they have the medical, extenuating medical condition, um, then those would be the primary drivers for allowing them in. The, uh, the 950, are they evenly spread K to 12? Yeah, pretty much. The percentage, it's a really, it's, it's, it's actually quite amazing that it says almost 10%, probably give or plus if you per K play. Three or four percent percent for each school. Jeff, since obviously you're talking post pandemic for some of this, has this, how, how does like the state feel, DOE and stuff like that? Because obviously I'm assuming this is going to be discussed and there, we are moving forward because currently there's support for this work, um, both in the uh, accountability side, as well as the academic and meeting needs side of the community. Um, we are I'm fairly confident that moving forward, at least for next year, the pandemic is still going to have an impact because we're still going to have the need for quarantining of students. That's the, we don't hear that going away. Positive cases, quarantining, contact tracing, students being out for extended periods of time is still going to necessitate us being able to operate in a virtual space, even on a limited basis for those students who are in person. Um, but there is a my conversations at the table with DOE, as well as through the chief's meetings and other work group meetings, is they're very uh, favorable uh, on the notion of a virtual program that supports the needs of students. Uh, and it, they're, they're willing to come to the table to, 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 to talk through that. Any other questions? Pete, you want to give a quick summer update? Yeah, we've been really busy uh, trying to stand up our summer programs. We have uh, looks close to a thousand kids at this point um, signed up for face-to-face -face classes at um, at one of our elementary or middle school sites. At this point, um, we have two in-person elementary sites: one at Eisenberg um, for students for um, Eisenberg and Castle Hills, and another Pleasantville for students at the six other schools. And then we have uh, programs uh, through a partnership with Summer Collab at um, McCullough, George Reed, and Gunning Bedford. So we're pretty excited about the opportunities. We have families that are listening right now. Um, we can use, a di we have plenty of spaces at McCullough and George Reed and Gunning Bedford. Um, so please encourage and, sh and share the word um, that we have in-person learning opportunities at, at those sites. Um, at, the high school. at the high school, we have a couple different things going on. They're in the process of, of uh, developing their offerings still. Um, we have credit recovery, which is pretty typical for students that um, struggled to um, you know, earn credits this past uh, school year in particular. 
Um, we're working on some initial credit work, um, which is kind of a new new thing for us. And then also we have a, a driver that, of course, will go on through the summer because that was really pretty heavily impacted by the pandemic on um, last spring as we're still in the, in the catch up mode, the way I understand it. So we're working on all of those. And then um, we have a, a, a variety of virtual opportunities as well. Um, so families that choose that as an option, they can still pick that and we have plenty of space in actually any of our programs for virtual enrollment and virtual programming. And then um, uh, we have a number of uh, special programs that are either part, uh, part time, like half day or full day programs. But the programs I mentioned earlier are all full day programs. Um, and all of the programs I mentioned are, are free of charge to the community. To our, to our families, which I think is a, a, a terrific opportunity. I think the, the biggest challenge and hurdle that we have um, been facing this year actually is, is staffing for the programs. And so we've um, been pretty creative with some of those staffing models and reached out to some of our you know, partners um, to help us staff the staff of buildings and, and create opportunities for kids. I'm also excited, I think we have close to about a dozen uh, William Penn kids that are going to be working this summer. So Cheyenne, are you working? Yeah. Awesome. Which program are you working on? Um, summer Collab um, at the middle school. Excellent. Excellent. Welcome aboard. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're excited to have a, a, a number of William Penn kids that are participating, so giving them that opportunity. How about transportation? Uh, Drew feels pretty good about transportation all across the board, which is, which is good. Um, the summer students in person. There's also the feeding program. We're yeah. continuing with the feeding program. Good. And we'll have transportation and nutrition services working. Good. We're in good shape. And then we're also going to um, at both the both the elementary camps. We'll have some of our William Penn um, uh, kids uh, running some some athletic camps as well. Um, Really, the fun, fun time that we've done that in the past. But we have always done that at William Penn. This year, we're shifting it to the sites, so it's a good opportunity for them to have a, a week's worth of uh, football camp or soccer camp or you know whatever camp it might be, um, right on site there at this school. Questions on it? Okay. Thank you. Is it uh, the next up for me would be the EPER extra paper extra responsibility allocations uh, in your packet on board docs? Looking is the uh, we ask that the board would uh, consider an act of public proposed 21 22 EPER allocations as presented. For your context, it's the exact same proposal from last year. Uh, I'll entertain any questions. Under a motion. So moved. Under your second. Second. We move by Mr. Handy, seconded by, by Mr. Crossan to approve the EFER extra pay, extra responsibility allocations as presented by the administration for the year 2021 2022. Questions? Hearing none, all favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay. And by the last update and action item is a financial position report, and uh, the staff team is going to uh, walk through that. I believe we're going to have a couple of slides up on the screen just to kind of bring up the conversation. <laughs> okay, so um, we are looking at our financial position report. Um, to go to the next slide, um, we do this three times a year. For Delaware state law, um, the due dates for these reports are, are February 1st, May 1st, and August 31st. Um, I have submitted the preliminary data to the Department of Ed pending approval by, uh, by this body, so that's already been done. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of these reports is basically to make sure that we can make our, the various financial milestones throughout the year. This one projects to the end of the fiscal year to ensure that we have enough cash on hand to get us through the summer months when our local tax revenues are at their, their lowest um, for when we get the new receipts come the end of September. Um, <clears throat> the May 1 report as included in your board packet does show that we have sufficient funds um, projected on June 30th to meet all of our obligations until our 22 tax receipts are received. And I am happy to entertain any questions you may have about the report. 
Any questions? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve the financial report as, as it was presented? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the financial position report as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Moved by Mr. Schiller, second by Mr. PQ. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. This position report is approved. Next order of business we have is the Delaware School Board Association updates. Mr. Cross, Mr. Um, yeah, for the legislative committee, uh, there was actually a, a lot going on there. Um, from what we're seeing, uh, board terms law has moved out of committee. Uh, we still keep the stance. Uh, the entire committee is keeping the stance of uh, opposing it uh, for now, for the reasons we discussed before. Um, the What they're calling for HB 100, the mental health bill, which is going to pro be providing mental health um, uh, employees for uh, schools. Uh, we're supporting that if funded by the state, but from what it's looking like, there is going to be a local cost for us. And it's looking like everything is moving along there. So it's just uh, to kind of keep track of that one. Um, Ms. Falcon, are you aware of that one? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, we are, we are um, prepared to support the local salary expense for any of the positions that would come forward from that bill. And then um, the other one's going to be HB 110, which is now changing busing uh, from K through six within a one mile or two mile range to we're now extending that to eighth grade um, for that. So I believe what we've discussed before, that's gonna add five extra bus routes, I believe, for who I talked to about that. Um, and I talked to somebody. I think it impacted us in some way, shape or form five I thought it was five routes. I think oh, it was Jeff. I maybe I talked to you. Drew said that it did impact us that changing the one mile radius for our eighth graders. Because that's okay. currently sixth graders are two mile or one mile, seventh and eighth graders are two mile. Yes. We're walking making the seventh, seventh yeah. graders and eighth graders are walking. I, it does impact us. We are going to add, it will impact us. Yes. There are districts and it doesn't impact, but it does impact yeah. us. So and I thought it was to the tune of five, five bus runs that got affected and of course in the middle of COVID, that doesn't make things any easier but hopefully with restrictions are hopefully going to be coming down um it, it feels like a no-brainer it will cost a little bit to us a couple thousand from what they judged um to, to not extend the same courtesy if you have a family member you know if you have a brother or sister and they have to walk but the other younger brother or sister can ride the bus it, it makes sense to go to eighth grade uh, so they're going to be correcting that one and they said that looks like it's going to uh have no issue being passed. Um, HB 129, which is the wellness center bill where they're gonna start having the states pay. We got a lot of props for that one. Um, they, they pretty much said that we kind of set the tone and encourage that and, you know, uh, so I, I just think that was something to be mentioned because that's gonna pass. And they said a lot of that had to do with what Colonial's work was for the past many years for our wellness centers. Um, so I think it's just something for us to be proud of. Um, the big thing that I think we need to discuss because it's going to pass is going to be Senate Bill 94, and that's going to be allowing, if we approve it in our, in our policies, virtual meetings after the pandemic is over for school boards. And so we need to discuss if we want um, to allow public comment virtually, if we want to allow our board members to have a virtual meeting you know, to, to attend the meeting virtually uh, because the law is now going to allow us to change our policy for that. Um, so that's something in the future we should look to add and have a discussion about because they say that's going to pass pretty easily from what they feel like. And the committee did approve it as well and supported it. Board of Directors, John, in it? No, I can speak to Leo. I'll speak to him to be his Okay. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Items removed from the consent agenda. We had none. Do we have any public comment? Mm. Ms. Russell? No. 
That being said, no other business from any of the members of the board. Not do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Would, what? Sorry, one second. Will this be Cheyenne's last meeting? No, no. She's eleventh grader, right? Yes. No, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. It's end of the year. I just we wanted to. Yeah, I so was didn't have to go through the. Uh, all so easy. I know. <laughs> I, I please, please continue then. Yep. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Or adjourned. Thank you.